Hello and welcome to a special Devil's Advocate brought to you from 10 Downing Street in London. As Britain prepares for the Summer Olympics as well as the Queen's Jubilee, how does it view relations with India? That's the key question I shall put today to the Prime Minister of the country, David Cameron. Prime Minister Cameron, as 2012, a critical year for Britain, gets underway, how do you view the relationship with India? Well, I think it's a special relationship. I think it's a very strong relationship. India was the first country I did a proper official visit to when I became leader of the opposition, and it's been one of the first countries I visited as prime minister. And I think there's a good reason for this relationship being special, in that we've got all the ties of uh, history and uh, language and many of our shared uh, culture and views but also it's a thoroughly modern relationship. There are many people from India who've made their home in Britain, many from Britain in India. We're huge investors in each other's countries. We share so many of the same enthusiasms and passions. So I see there's a thoroughly modern relationship that can draw its strength from the past, but it's got a long way to go. Now, as you said, this is a special relationship, and Britain put a lot of store in winning the Indian jet fighter deal and felt snubbed when it went to Rafale. Does the typhoon still stand a chance, or have you come to accept that this one's gone to the French? Well, of course, we're disappointed by what has happened, uh, but we still think that uh, typhoon is the best aircraft, is the best value, has the, uh, the best capabilities, the longest life, and the rest of it. We'll still press the case, uh, and we'll, it will be for the Indians to decide what they eventually buy. So you still think there is a chance that they may take the typhoon? Very much it's up to the Indian government. Obviously, there's been a setback with the uh, initial uh, look at uh, Rafael, but... Uh, we will go on pressing the case that this is a very, very strong aircraft and we, we believe that uh, people will see the logic. But that's for the Indian government in the end to decide. You said that there had been a setback and clearly from the press one got the feeling that there was a cloud over the horizon. As you know, there were howls of protest in February. Some MPs spoke about India being ungrateful. The press called for a cut in aid. Has this affected the relationship? No, I don't think so. Look, we are both uh, uh, grown up countries, mature countries that understand that uh, there's a need clearly for India to have uh, the best jet fighter uh, available. We think that's the typhoon, but that's India's decision. Our relationship, though, is far wider than that. And I don't make connections between uh, one part of the relationship and another. I don't think that's the right way for modern countries to work. Uh, but I think typhoon would be a great deal for India and for Britain. But it won't stop me uh, then going ahead and saying, let's go on maximizing trade and investment between our countries. Let's go on and work on all the political and security and diplomatic issues that we have uh, together. Of course not. So your intention, whether you get the typhoon deal or not, is to push and boost trade and the wider relationship with India? Yes, absolutely. I mean, let's take it from Britain's perspective. India is the third largest investor into Britain. I think some people have a sort of outdated view that uh, there's a lot of outsourcing going on from Britain to India, but that's the extent of the relationship. Completely wrong. I mean, India owns, Indian businesses own some of the most iconic British brands, companies like Jaguar Land Rover that are selling cars all over the world. What a great combination between Indian capital and British labour. Uh, that's actually producing a well-beating car. And this is what you want to build on? Much more. I want to see more inward investment from India into Britain, and I want to see more investment from Britain into India. I think there's a great complementarity between our economies uh, in terms of the different strengths of the two. At one particular area I'm very keen on and have spoken to uh, Prime Minister Singh about this on, on many occasions is our expertise in insurance and banking and finance and retail and we hope that over time the Indian economy will keep opening up in the way that it's so Except successfully for the opened fact up. That those are reforms that keep being talked about and India not delivered upon. Some of them are in fact seven years old and still not delivered on. Are you disappointed that despite the rhetoric the delivery in terms of banking, insurance, pension reforms actually is non-existent. Well, of course, I, I always want things to go further and faster, but I'm one of life's optimists, and I think that the logic of and the, the benefit to both countries of progressively opening up our trade and investment is so great. We'll create more jobs, we'll create more wealth, both in India and Britain, that I think in the end the argument will, will win on its own merit. But I will go on pushing and, and, and trying to What explanation does Dr. Singh give you when he fails to deliver, despite the fact he's promised, for instance, insurance reforms way back in 2004 when he first came to power, 
You must raise this with him, surely. What explanation does he give for failure to deliver? Well, I think it's, it's never easy in any political system to make changes that involve opening up. There are always interests in your own country saying, well, well don't make that change, don't, don't uh, uh, make that uh, alteration. Uh, I think we have to just go on making the argument, and that's the discussion that Prime Minister Singh and I have. You sound I, very I, understanding. I'm a very understanding person, but I think... Uh, but aren't you a little irritated by the delay, a little impatient? Of course I want want the opening up to take place, but it's for the Indian political system and the Indian government to make that decision. I, I will just go on making the arguments about why it's beneficial. I mean, look at, at Britain. We are one of the most open economies in the world. It's very easy for companies to come and invest here, to set up businesses here, to float on the stock market here. That is our strength. And, uh, and you want Dr. Singh to uh, do the same thing, well, but he doesn't do it very quickly well, and he doesn't do it very fast. But India is a different economy at a different stage of development. There are different pressures. I understand that, but I'll go on making the argument. And I think our two business councils that meet together and discuss these issues make very good progress I in uh, keeping up the pressure for these changes to Prime happen. Minister, let's come to what could be an issue that bedevils the relationship over the next four months. I'm talking about... Dow chemical sponsorship mm -hmm. of the Olympics. Now, the Indian government has formally asked for Dow to be dropped as a sponsor. Do you, as Prime Minister of Britain, understand and sympathize with the sentiment behind that poll, or do you oppose it? Well, of course, I understand the, the anger there is about the huge suffering that happened uh, at Bhopal and afterwards. And, you know, frankly, my heart still goes out to the families that suffered from that appalling tragedy. I'm, I, I can remember as a as a young man reading about that and being profoundly shocked about what, ha about, about what happened. But I do think we have to recognize two important points. The first is that uh, Dow was not the owner of uh, Union Carbide at the time, so this is a different uh, company, a, a different business. But secondly and more importantly, the sponsorship of Dow for the Olympics is, is arranged and uh, done by the International Olympic Committee. It is their decision-making process that that is the case, and, and uh, I, I don't uh, criticize their decision-making process. So I think it would be tragic if, uh, because of the terrible thing that happened uh, those years ago um, uh, uh, with Union Carbide, were to somehow affect Indian participation in the Olympics. I understand, of course, uh, the pressures and all the rest of it, but I do think, for the two reasons I give, I think it would be, it would be a very sad day. This is, as I'm sure you understand, a very emotional as well mm -hmm. as a very political issue in India. Let me first of all put to you how the Indian people view yeah. it. They say that the settlement that was reached in 1989 was based on the assumption that only 3,000 had died, and somewhere between 30,000 and 40,000 were injured. Since then, the Indian Council for Medical Research has established that over 20,000 died, and the numbers injured is well above two or three hundred thousand. In these circumstances, the Indian view is that surely Union Carbide and Dow as the successor company that inherited its liabilities has a moral responsibility to pay. Well, I think the, the point is, of course, there are responsibilities for those who were acting, who, that, that company at the time, uh, uh, that is absolutely clear. And of course, any successor company has uh, responsibilities that it took on, that it took company. on at the time. But I think to argue that that somehow overrides what ought to be an Olympics that is about athletes coming from all over the world to compete. And when Dow, which is a, a reputable company, has uh, come to be a sponsor of the International Olympic Committee and therefore a sponsor of the Olympics, to conflate those two issues, I think, would, not, would be wrong. Let me put to you what the Indians would say in response to what you just said to me. They mm. would point out that, for instance, in 1999, when Dow acquired Union Carbide, it set aside a sum of $2 billion to settle carbides as best liabilities in Texas. They argue, why can't Dow make a similar settlement to take into consideration what's happened in Bhopal? Because not only have tens of thousands died and hundreds of thousands been injured, but there's incalculable damage to the environment that has never been catered for. Well, I think that that's a perfectly sensible point to make. And of course, uh, there can continue to be discussions uh, between the interested parties and Dow Chemicals as this issue continues. But would it be right to escalate that into something that becomes a row about a perfectly uh, reputable international company that is a sponsor of the Olympics? I don't think it would. Is this not an ideal opportunity to force Dow to recognize a responsibility that up to now Dow doesn't wish to acknowledge because 
Dao would be embarrassed. This is an opening for people in India to force Dao to recognize this responsibility. Well, of course, that is for up to people to make their own decisions and to take their own uh, choices. What I'm saying is the British Prime Minister wanting to see the Olympics be successful and wanting to see the Olympics not used for uh, industrial or political or other purposes, that I, I cannot see a problem with the International Olympic Committee being sponsored by Dow. I think it followed perfectly reasonable processes. Therefore, I cannot complain about Dow sponsoring the London Olympics. And therefore, I very much hope that this issue, uh, that these two issues won't, won't collide uh, at the London Olympics. I don't see why that should happen. So, but it, I can't tell other people what to do. I can just tell you my own responsibilities as British Prime Minister and my own examination of this issue. And I think I've set out that position. In the letter that the Indian government has formally written to the International Olympic Committee, they've actually gone one step further. They've challenged the point you've just made, that Dow is a reputable company and a suitable sponsor of the Olympics. They point out that to retain Dow as a sponsor would make a mockery of the very ideals that the Olympics stands for. But uh, even if you take that view, then the people to take that up with is the International Olympic Committee. The International Olympic Committee is above any one, it doesn't belong to any country or to any government. It is an international organization to which we, India, Britain, other countries uh, are all, as it were, uh, supporters and, and uh, signatories to, as it were. So I even if you take that view, the people to take that up with is the IOC, not with the uh, British government and the Olympics that Let we're holding in you, Because you are Prime Minister of Britain, the argument that the Indian government is attempting to make with the IOC. They say that retaining Dow would be a conflict with the code of ethics of the Olympics and in particular with the integrity code. And I've quote to you that integrity code. It says the Olympic parties must not be involved with firms whose reputation, mark that word, Prime Minister, reputation is inconsistent with the principles set out in the Olympic Charter. Surely. Dow's reputation in refusing to recognize the moral responsibility it's inherited from Union Carbide means it's not a fitting partner for the Olympics. Well, that is, as I say, I don't take that view, but that is anyway, it's not a view for me, it's a view for the International Olympic Committee. But as Prime Minister of Britain, are you worried that if Dow is retained as a sponsor, there's a possibility that India might end up boycotting the Olympics. Well, of course, I don't want that to happen. I want Indian athletes to come and compete in what I think is going to be a fantastic Olympics here in London this summer 2012. I, I want them to come. Uh, but as I say, my responsibilities are to make sure the Olympics is properly staged, to make sure that uh, we, we roll out a really warm welcome to people. Uh, obviously, if people have a difficulty with individual Olympic sponsors, I don't happen to share that view in the way that you've put it, but if people do, they can take that up with the IOC and then they have to make their own decisions. Now, as you speak to me today, tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of Indians will be listening to you. What would a Indian boycott mean to Britain, were it to happen? Well, I think it would be very sad. Britain and India are old friends, are old partners. Um, we very much enjoyed coming to the Commonwealth Games uh, in India. Uh, we, we're looking forward to welcoming Indian athletes here. It would be very sad. India's got an enormous amount to bring to the Olympics. I think even if you take a, uh, as I said, I feel huge sympathy for those who were injured and killed because of what happened at Union Carbide in, in Bhopal. Huge sympathy for that. But I would argue even if you take the view uh, that you've expressed, it's still a boycott would not be the right uh, action. By all means, take this up with the IOC. Make the complaint. But a boycott would not be the right action. I think it would be very sad for Indian athletes, sad for India, sad for Britain. Of course, it would be desperately sad. But I, I can't uh, tell people to come. I can't, uh, it's, it's, as I said, I think I've fulfilled all my responsibilities. I very much hope the Indian athletes and the Indian government will choose to come. Were the Indian government under pressure from lobbies, NGOs, or public opinion in India to boycott? Would that affect the relationship? Would it be a souring note? Well, obviously, it'd be a very sad day um, because this is going to be a, I think, successful global event where we want the world's best athletes to come and compete here in Britain. Uh, and I think if this was to get caught up in these in, in industrial and political issues, I think it'd be very, very sad uh, for all concerned. But be, but be in no doubt, my focus has got to be making sure we deliver a successful Olympic. It's quite clear to me that in Britain, for too many years, we've had a lot of bogus colleges offering rather bogus courses to people who, of course, want to come to Britain, but mainly want to come to Britain to work rather than study.
Prime Minister, let's come to your government's decision to permit a sharp increase in university fees from, I believe, this autumn, along with the fact that now it's going to be more difficult for overseas students to get jobs in Britain after they finish their studies. This is going to have an adverse impact on the inflow of Indian students coming to Britain, and in turn, it's going to weaken one of the most critical bonds that have tied the two countries together. Does it worry you that you might be loosening the relationship just when you actually want to bring the two countries closer together? No, I don't think it, it will have those effects, because I think there are two important facts that we need to bear in mind. The first is, if you compare last year with 10 years ago, uh, whereas 10 years ago there were some 14,000 Indian students coming to Britain, last year there was something like 39,000. So there's been a huge increase, which we welcome, of Indian students coming to Britain. The second point, which is absolutely uh, vital, is that we're making a very clear offer to students from India and all around the world, which is that if you can speak English and if you can have a place, if you can get a place at a British university, you can come and have a visa for that place at the university, and as you graduate, you will be able to work for a period in a graduate job. Now, that is an incredibly, I think, open, simple, straightforward offer. Now, it may mean that some people who previously travelled to, 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 to do courses in uh, facilities that aren't really that highly regarded, and in many cases haven't been proper uh, educational courses, it may mean those people can't come, but it's actually a very big, open and generous offer to people who can speak English, who have degree places, and who really want to, to study and make a contribution. It's interesting that you should mention that last year 39,000 Indian students came to Britain, because at the same time, over 103,000 went to the United States, and that's the real problem. A student, when he comes to England, doesn't simply get education. He or she imbibes your culture and your lifestyle. Many then turn to look upon England as a second but If, you, if, if you now do, they're if you going to the America, the you're losing that whole body of Indian influence to the Americans. But if you do the mathematics, I mean, America is five times the size, in population, five times the size of Britain, and yet, according to your figures, uh, only taking uh, two-thirds more students. So uh, I would think, actually, even on those figures... Two and a half times more students. Well, no, it's taking, it's, I think you said 39,000 39, and 103,000. 103, well, okay, so that's, we, we are a fifth of the population of America, but we're taking a third of the students. So on that basis, we're not doing badly. But the key, I think, is actually not just the broad numbers of students. It's quite clear to me that in Britain, for too many years, we've had a lot of bogus colleges offering rather bogus courses to people who, of course, want to come to Britain, but mainly want to come to Britain to work rather than study. What this government is doing is making sense of an immigration system that has been a bit confused. And we're very clear that on the student path, we want those students to come, but they should be students that are going to proper colleges and universities to do proper courses and afterwards can work for a period as graduates. I think that is a very uh, big and good offer, which will further link uh, Indian students and Britain, and as you say, not just study at our universities but imbibe the culture, leave with a love of Britain and want to do business with Britain, which is exactly what I well, want. You know, it's very interesting you should say that they should leave with a love of Britain increasingly because the costs have gone up so phenomenally, and remember, the new university fees are going to be almost 300% higher than what they used to be. Because of that, increasingly, Indian students are choosing to live in India whilst enrolling in British educational institutions. They may end up getting a British degree but their love and affection for the country simply won't develop. Well, I think you have to ask the question, why are we charging fees for British universities? And uh, the reason is we want our universities to continue to be amongst the best in the world. Now, if you want to have great universities with great libraries, great research institutes, great tutors, all the things so that Cambridge and Oxford and London and uh, Bristol and other universities still are as good as anything available in America, if you want that, that costs money. Now, where's the money going to come from? Is it going to come from the taxpayer, uh, who already has to fill a big hole with a big deficit and big debt, or should we charge the successful graduates for the successful uh, university education they receive? I think other countries will look at what we're doing in Britain with university fees and say, actually, that is the right way to ensure you have strong and growing universities in a very competitive world. Your logic is unimpeachable as far as the financing of universities goes, but the fact is, because yours are becoming so expensive in England, Indian students are going to America where you get scholarships. You don't get the same number of scholarships here, and as a result, the logic is on your side. But the emotional bond and attachment that got formed for generations mm. when Indians came to your country is breaking down. Well, we, are we, we already have good scholarship programs, and we are announcing, actually, this week, extra scholarships for uh, Indian students as well, which uh, I have separately announced. So 
I think there are a lot of scholarships available, but the general point, I would say, to Indian students watching this program, thinking of where to go to university, I would say come to Britain because we have the world's language, we have some of the best universities anywhere in the world, and we have a scheme to make sure they're going to go on being the best universities. Now, of course, you can go to less expensive universities in other parts of the world, but you have to ask yourself, is the degree I'm going to get at the end of that going to be as good as from a great British university that now has a way of funding itself and making sure the quality is as high uh, as I'm sure Indian students So in a nutshell what you're saying to Indian students is even if the cost goes up and in some cases it may go up by 300 percent British universities remain the best pay that and come here because the education you'll get is better than you'll get anywhere else. Is that the message you're giving I'm us? saying that quality costs money we're being very upfront about how it should be paid but if you pay that money, you'll get a very good degree, and that will stand you in good stead for the rest of your life, and it will, as you say, deepen the relationship between Britain and India. You're not worried at all that the economic cost of coming to England might actually, over a period of time, lessen the bonds that have knitted the countries together? Well, I think the worst thing, and this is normally what politicians do, is they stick their head in the sand, they don't realise that universities are getting more expensive, they don't think of a way of paying for it, they try to expand university education without finding the money for it, and suddenly you'll wake up one day and universities in France and in Germany and other places in the world will have overtaken you. I'm determined that's not going to happen. So this government has taken difficult decisions to say we're going to charge students uh, after they've left for the cost of that education. And I think as a result, we'll be holding our head up high in future years because our universities will have very high quality degrees. And you hope that Indian students will recognize that and come even if it costs them more? I think that Indian students, they know that quality costs money. Uh, they know we have great universities in Britain, and, and they know that if you come to Britain, one of the most open and multiracial countries anywhere on earth, you will find people uh, like others who come from every part of India who, along with the British people, will give you a very, very warm welcome. David Cameron, a pleasure speaking. Thank you.